Welcome to the Academy of Esports podcast. I am your host, James O'Hagan, and this week I get to welcome in Dr. William Watson. He is the uh, Associate Professor of Learning Design and Technology at Purdue University and also the Director of Purdue Center for Serious Games and Learning in Virtual Environments. Dr. Watson, thank you for being a guest on the Academy of Esports podcast today. Thank you for having me. Uh, we were connected through uh, Mr. Chris Bishop, who is with the Office of Engagement at the University. We're working on a symposium that will be taking place on campus April 8th and 9th in West Lafayette. But this is an opportunity for us to get some one-on-one -on -one to promote the work that you are doing on campus and get some of your additional thoughts, because sometimes we know that panel discussions, people get lost along the way. And so we want to make sure that we give you a uh, proper due here. But before we dive into your work, and, and, and again, even though you're an IU grad, it's fine. We'll, 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 we'll still, you know, you, you've seen the light, you've come to the right campus, it's yes, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and I say that jokingly because IU, and those of you who don't know IU and Purdue are rival schools. Let's, get, uh, let's do some uh, getting to know you questions if we shall. So first question that I like to ask guests is, what is a game, and it doesn't have to be a video game, that stands out as having been important to you at some point in your life? Why was the experience meaningful? Sure. So that's an easy one for me because I, I am, have been obsessed and remain obsessed with the Last of Us series. Um, you know, the first one came out, uh, that would have been PlayStation 3, I guess. So I don't know how long that's been, 10, 12 years or so. Um, and for me as a gamer, I've always been heavily driven by uh, strong narrative games. And honestly, those have tended to be kind of hit and miss. Part of my early work um, in the field was actually even discussing the role of video games in narrative because there have been people who, who claim that they actually don't fit within traditional narrative and others who counter that. Um, but The Last of Us really was the first game that I remember the narrative just completely emotionally engaging me and, and sweeping me away. Um, not that you know it doesn't have great gameplay and beautiful art and everything else it does, really well but they really set out to do that series to really show in a sense that video games can stand alongside you know movies television um literature uh as a form of narrative and, and, and hold its own so um i can't even tell you how many times i played the first game and then uh, of course they came out with the, the the second one after initially saying they might not make a, a second one because they told the story they wanted they came out with one that pushed it even further and just um, kind of, I mean, the, the second one kind of just wrecks you. And and uh, I played through that one and it just like left me emotionally drained that I couldn't put it away and actually immediately picked it up and played it through again. I almost felt like I had to play it again to process it. So that series, I'm just, I'm obsessed with that series. I have uh, the soundtracks on vinyl. I have the making of books for those. And so really, that's the game that just really stands out to me is just um, really showing what games can do in the narrative space um, and how they can engage you and, and move you emotionally and get you attached to characters um, as well, or even better than some of the other forms of media that we use to engage narrative with. I, I think where they excelled also as another layer that has done better than movies, books, TV has done was the use of adaptive technology for people with disabilities, hard of seeing, hard of hearing. Absolutely. They 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 really took uh, a disability compliance to a whole nother level and set a bar and a standard of this. These games are so important for everybody. Let's use the technology that's available to really make sure that everybody can enjoy this game in the level and sense that that we want them to or that they're able to. Fully. And being inclusive and diverse as well, they, Naughty Dog really leads the way in so many ways. Um, I really respect what they do. Uh, and you're absolutely right, you know, in terms of both uh, technology, what they're doing and making the games accessible as well as being inclusive in their storytelling and with the characters and not in a false or forced way, but really uh, a natural way. I just think uh, they lead in so many dimensions around that. All right. Well, our second question, and, and this one's a little different than the gaming question. Maybe it's totally eccentric or maybe it's quite traditional, but what is your superpower? That thing that you do better than most people, what do you, or what do you wish you could do? 
It's funny because uh, actually a joke with my wife is that uh, I always say if if I were a superhero, my name would be Captain Wrong Lane because invariably I choose the slowest checkout at the at the grocery store or the wrong lane on the highway to get into. So that's not the superpower I want, but that's the superpower I have or the super curse anyway. But um, the, the other side of the thing is my background uh, comes out of uh, literature. My focus as an undergrad was English literature, but with a focus on creative writing. So I wrote poetry, I wrote um, literature, and I feel like that creativity is a big piece of what I do as well as um, bringing a particular lens to how do I look at things and how I look at problems and how I might want to try to solve them. Um, that has bled into my work in terms of um, trying to leverage technology to envision new, a new system of education that's better suited for today's um, world and its its needs and what society wants from us. So I, I think bringing that creative lens um, and the way of examining problems and, and finding new ways that we might try to approach and solve them is something that I do quite well. Very cool. Uh, so you're the person on 65 going north or south who's in the left lane and just cruising there, right? No, I don't want to cruise, but I somehow <laughs> get trapped. I'm the person who gets trapped uh, between the semi and the other cars going slow and I can't get out. And I never should have gotten there in the first place. <laughs> That's very much an Indiana joke for you people who uh, who have not driven 65 north or south between Chicago and Indy. It's a two-lane road and boy, it always invariably you get stuck between somebody. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, third question. Name one song that whenever it hits your speakers, you're going to sing along to. Oh, that's a, I, I, I have a pretty sizable vinyl collection. That's been my latest uh, addiction. Um, so that's a hard one to call. I'm a huge Beatles fan. I'm a huge Paul Simon fan. Uh, so I'd probably say we'd have to go with one of those. Um, probably, um, uh, let's see, George was always my favorite. So probably Here Comes the Sun is the one that would stick with me the most. Fantastic. Great song. And this kind of gets us into our conversation a little bit. So we're doing a little transitional question here. What is one thing about your field that surprises people when they hear about it? So again, your, your PhD is in instructional technology, is in, is in inf informational or instructional technology? Instructional technology, yes. Okay. So you and I have worked, I just haven't finished my dissertation. Work. Mm -hmm. So we worked in very similar fields, but what's something that surprises you or surprises other people about the work that you do? Well, I think one thing is that um, our field is actually quite strong and getting stronger um, because people are finally recognizing the need for it. Um, but I think by and large, we've kind of, in this country anyway, been a little bit of an invisible field in that we've been active, we've been influencing things, but a lot of people still don't really know who we are or what we do. So when I tell someone I'm an instructional technologist or I working learning design and technology, they don't really know what that is and, you know, what does that mean? And in fact, my mom, you know, when I first got started in academia, it was as a lecturer of computer and information technology at IEPUI. Uh, and my mom still tells me I do stuff with computers. That's what she tells everyone, which is like, well, yeah, but most people on the planet do. And it's not really my, my focus, you know. So I think um, we're a little bit invisible in, ter in terms of that, you know, every university is, is using instructional designers. A lot of major corporations are using instructional designers and trainers uh, to develop and design their curriculum, to evaluate and test and helps with their learners. But by and large, the average person on the street is kind of unaware of that and kind of unaware of um, how the field is really flourishing, particularly since the pandemic, uh, when suddenly everyone had to use technology to move to uh, remote learning. Um, that really raised the, the view of the field that, oh, actually, there are people who are experts in this and who've been working on this for decades. Um, and they're out there and they're employed everywhere and there's a further need for them. Um, so I think uh, we've kind of skimmed under the surface a little bit, but um, um, the average person on the street might not not know what we do, um, but it's a flourishing area. You know, I'm always amazed at people who just go, well, just write some curriculum mm -hmm. and, and everything will be great. Right. And what I think you realize, and I know I realize too, is that writing curriculum is, is not just saying, okay, here's our outcomes that we want. Here's our inputs that we want you to be able to do. And at the end, you're going to do these things. It goes, it's almost like you have to be a social scientist. It almost has to be like, you have to understand the environment in which you're stepping into that this curriculum will be used because if technology accessibility is a problem or, you know, there's social issues where um, the, the, that 
you can't use tech, certain kinds of technology or even just, you know, access in a community. We can have all these great things. You can write all the curriculum that you want, but unless the community it, it's socially acceptable or it's socially viable for the community of users, the best curriculum doesn't matter. It's almost, it, there's a lot of turnkey solutions out there, I know, mm -hmm. but I think what people are starting to realize is that these turnkey solutions are very rarely ever plug and play. You have to do, there's a whole other layer. Do you find that as well too? I do. I know I do in my role as a technology director. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, even specifically around the inclusion of games uh, in the classroom um, or even formal learning environments, um, you know, the example I like to give is um, like many in Indiana, when I grew up in elementary school, my first introduction to a learning game was Oregon Trail. And with that in history class, it was like, here, there's a learning game. You're going to learn from it. Go play it. So, you know, play it. And my experience was like, oh, it's a game. I know how to do this. I can shoot lots of deer when I'm hunting because I'm used to shooting things in games, you know. So I kill and kill and kill and kill in the game. And then what did I really learn from it? Well, not not much. So you can't just take something and say, you know, even something as great and as engaging as a game with Oregon Trail is great. There's lots of opportunities to learn from it, but you can't just say this is going to be the magic wand that we wave and everybody's going to learn from it and it's going to do all the work. Um, you know, so that's something I talk about with teachers a lot is that if you're learning to include games, these games are not replacing you. You are not unnecessary. You are a vital key part in making sure that the learning happens out of that. So it absolutely is something, even apart from designing for different contexts and restraints and different types of learners, um, it's an issue of how we implement and how we do things effectively and how we scaffold and support all the learning that can take place there. Yeah, I, I, my, my strategy for Oregon Trail as a kid was uh, I'm going to be the banker and I need four oxen and all the bullets I can get. Uh -huh. And then I'm going to go off and go hunting, but I can only carry back uh, 200 pounds of, of meat or 10 pounds of meat or whatever it is. Like, yeah, I killed all these buffalo and it's, yeah, you only you know, exactly. get a little bit there. But it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, we got to Oregon, but uh, you know, little Timmy died of dysentery somewhere yes. along the way as well, too. Um, all right. So, as you're working within the uh, first of all, the the Center for Serious Games and Learning in Virtual Environments that uh, that is something that was not on campus when I was there. I graduated in '99. What is what is the uh, the center about? What is what is the purpose and the focus of the center? So we fill a couple of roles. Some is around uh, designing educational games. Um, we've worked some on developing educational games as well. Um, I've supported teachers and done some workshops around helping them understand how to identify learning games and, and implement in the classroom and, and make sure they're effective. Uh, we also assess the impact of different educational game projects that we get brought on. So it's really serving as a, as a way for us to engage, including with other people at Purdue and around different grant projects that come up around uh, either designing new games and developing new games or assessing games um, or even just supporting uh, learning outcomes from uh, existing games as well. Okay. Now, as you've been working through this, then what is one of the main challenges you see right now in gaming or esports even? Um, and what are some of the best ways that you guess you could see to tackle some of these problems that you're seeing? Well, what, what, again, when I first started my studies in uh, instructional technology, games were going to be my focus. It's like learning games. And that, that arose from my experiences with when I was at IEPY. There's two very distinct uh, learner groups. There's kind of the traditional college freshman who's right out of, you know, high school. Um, and then there are people who had never gone to college or they had gone briefly and not succeeded. And they've been working for 10, 15 years in the field. And now they've decided to come back and get their uh get their degree. And what really struck me and drove me to um, go into academia and study this was that um, those learner groups were so profoundly, vastly different and that those coming right out of the high school had no idea how to regulate or in any way take control of their learning. Everything had to be brought to them, be told exactly what to do, uh, checked on and forced to do those things. So if they were asked to read something and there weren't points aside to the reading, they weren't going to do the reading, uh, despite the fact that they would be lost. Um, and taking things at a very entry level, um, uh, a very passive level, which is to be expected because our, our systems of education in the K-12 space tend to be very, very passive, where you are asked to sit there and be quiet and don't speak unless you're spoken to. Um, 
And then those who had been out of that environment for 10 or 15 years were completely opposite in that, that they would challenge you. They would ask questions and say, well, when I'm doing this at work, I'm not sure I agree with you. I think I might try this. So they really were squeezing every bit of learning they could. They were doing a lot of critical thinking. They were in command and directing their own learning. Um, and that's really what led me to say, what is, what's going on in a sense with our K-12 systems of education that it is taking, the longer people are away from that, the more in control and critical thinking they are with their learning approach. And my original understanding with that was like, well, we just need better instruction, more engaging instruction. So games, I'm a gamer, games are the way to, to go. So that's gonna be my focus. Um, and quickly when I got into my studies, I realized the challenges with actually implementing games in the existing system of education, that it's not really that supportive for these sort of innovative and active learning um, experiences. So I kind of broadened from there to say, how can we create a system of education where this sort of engaging, critical thinking, problem solving sort of curriculum uh, is not only supported, but it's embraced. And that's the basis of what's going on, as opposed to something that you're, you're really trying to get a, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole, that, that you're having to fight and deal with all these barriers and challenges to making that happen. And I, I think that continues to be a real issue of um, uh, the current system just not supporting both the methods we should be using or the outcomes that we need. Um, so how do you try to implement these sorts of things in systems that are not designed to support it, I think continues to be the big thing that holds back a lot of teachers from wanting to go this direction. Or even if they go, it makes it a really big challenge for them. I know that in my uh, role as the director of digital and virtual learning for the Racine Unified School District, uh, we're, we're involved in, I oversee our scholastic esports program, and even talking with developers um, about, we, we use your games as educational tools, whether it's League of Legends, Overwatch, Rocket League, Smash Brothers, they're seeing those as competitive tools, they're seeing those as intellectual property, I get it. We are seeing these as, as being part of student-centered decisions, as a way to engage students, as teaching tools that go beyond the games. And it feels like there's there's still that disconnect of here's an intrinsically motivating game that these kids love to play. And on the other side is a developer who says, I don't know the education space, so I'm just gonna almost say either no, you can't, in the case of like a Riot or a, an Activision Blizzard right now, or we're gonna get early behind you and help you, but we don't really understand this as well quite yet either like an Epic Games or a high-res studio. Microsoft Education has done, I think, a really good job with Minecraft of stepping into this. But even now, they're still kind of scratching the surface on what Minecraft can be. Um, are you seeing that as well, too, with developers? Just I know that there's educational game companies, but let's even just take traditional games. Are there companies now that are still struggling with that that paradigm, I guess, if you will, of these aren't our typical gamers, but we we don't know quite what to do with it quite yet. Right. I, I think that's very, very common. You know, Roblox just announced that they're going to be going into the educational game space. But what are they basically doing? They're just hiring a couple of development companies to develop a couple of games. So when people are, it, it tends to be a toe in the water sort of thing that I'm going to stick a toe in the water. Like you said, Microsoft has done a lot, but even so, they're largely relying just on the community space to be driving all this. It's all the teachers who are, who are doing all the work and, and leveraging it. Um, so I do think with a lot of people, it's, it's, and it comes, it's, it's a common thing with innovation that we see, uh, particularly in, in higher education, when you're looking at the grant funding is, well, show us what's been proven to work and show what's being done, but the tools are not always in the, the, the platform and foundation has not always been put in place to support these sorts of things um, and to make them happen. So often it's, it's falling on the heads of the individual users to kind of carve out what they're going to be doing. You know, I studied a high school teacher who was using the Sims to teach sociology, um, which is certainly wasn't being designed. It wasn't designed to do that, but you know, he's leveraging it in his own creative ways. But yeah, I would say we're seeing, so an example I would give is um, the Assassin's Creed. They, so many people want to use Assassin's Creed for educational purposes. So they created what is essentially a museum mode where you can get in there and you can't kill anyone, but it's, it's taking this incredibly innovative space, and I'm glad they made the effort to create the mode so that it's easier for teachers to use. 
but it's like the most boring museum docent version of what learning could be is that now you will walk to this sign and I will lecture you for five minutes and then we'll walk to this sign and you'll, I'll lecture you for five minutes. So when I saw that, I was both excited and pulling my hair out like, oh my gosh, what you could have done with this if you'd kind of gone all in as kind of, instead of kind of doing a little add-on. Um, and I both appreciated the effort to provide the history and the learning opportunities there and the moans the way in which they did it in such a passive fashion when they had such amazing environments and technology to do it with. I, I feel the same way with uh, Red Dead Redemption, which again is a game that you can play it to its fullest extent, but also you can run around in this world and, and because they took such painstaking efforts to develop the, the nature, you know, the bird songs and sounds that they use and the plants that are available for you to study and learn about that were a part of not just, you know, botany, but also medicine mm -hmm. in, in, in the, uh, in these areas of the country. So I, I agree with you though. There hasn't been that one yet because it's interesting. And, and maybe you see this as well too. That kids don't, when, when teachers come and say, here's an educational game, you know, kids almost roll their eyes, mm -hmm. but if it's GTA, Assassin's Creed, over, you know, all these other ones, kids are like, okay, here's how we can bring this in. And again, teachers kind of look at it and go, well, I don't know what to do with this. Are you seeing that aspect of things playing as well, too? Because my students, when I tell them it's an educational game, they're like, mm, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, usually what that translates into is it's a game that was uh, underfunded for the development, you know, and they know that it's going to look like something that's 20 years old just because the funding wasn't around it. And, and they're going to be told to play it, you know, and part of that comes out of just the history, you know, games flourished, educational games first flourished, you know, when I was in school back in the 80s, but they quickly devolved into some very basic, just kind of drill and practice and grinding sort of, you know, that doesn't match a, match the creativity and the problem solving the, uh, and the immersion that was taking place in the mainstream games. And that has still played through to, to a degree, you know, when, when, when my son was younger and we were looking at, uh, you know, leap, leapfrog and leap pad games, I would go in there and, and dive into how many, you know, and probably 80% of them, I was just like, why would anyone want to play this, you know? And 20% um, of them were, were solid. So like anything else, you can't, you know, it, it's up to the game design. The, the majority of games are, are not successful. It's that 10% that are uber successful that really drive culture and society and, and the popularity of games. So, um, as I tell my students, uh, my educational game design students in my course, I say designing a game is really a, a good game is really difficult, and designing good instruction is really difficult, and designing a good instructional game is, you know, the biggest challenges of each of those to bring together. So, so it is a challenge, um, but certainly, uh, I think if more effort we put into it and we saw more mainstream support for it, you know, we we could certainly get there. But I would agree with you that. Uh, most students are like, yeah, this is not going to, this is going to be some silly, you know, version of a game that normally I would not pick up. All right. So uh, I guess that leads into next is uh, what are some of the concerns about the role of technology in our lives, especially, you know, it felt like everybody now before the pandemic was so concerned about screen time. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit and then the parents were like, well, my kid's not sitting in front of a computer for six hours a day getting school instruction. Exactly. So, so. You know, what what are some of your concerns right now about the role of technology in the lives of young people? Well, my biggest thing, and and, also, and honestly, um, social media is, is a big concern, one of the biggest concerns for me, not just for, for kids, but when we see the impacts that's happening with society in general. Um, an, an offshoot of my research has been on designing for attitudinal learning, um, which is often kind of a shadow curriculum where it's something they say they want the students to learn to like and respect science or they want them to be uh, democratic citizens and these sort of attitudinal focus areas. But ultimately, they're never really evaluating whether that's being met in any way. It's treated as kind of like if it's, if it's not cognitive, then it's not worthy of actually assessing and testing for. So I continue to be concerned. You know, we, we highlight, I'm a gamer, but we highly limit you know, our, our son's screen time. Um, I think, you know, behaviorally, if, if people are interacting just with the screen um, in, an, in isolation and not collaboratively with others, it can be problematic. So to me, it's, we're still seeing the growing pains in societies around the world around how people are able to handle not just the screen, but the 
these social interactions that are taking place in these places that are not, you know, they're not reality. We're actually talking to, you know, my son's nine and uh, he's online a little bit, you know, but not a ton, but he's still already talking about likes and, oh, did you share that video of me and did it get likes? And we're like, look, what is a like? It's someone you don't even know out there who's interacting with a million pieces of, of media during a day, pressing a button, it's, it's meaningless. It does not, you know, so we're having those sorts of discussions when we're talking about these sorts of things. But really, I think it's that social layer and this concept around social media, which is still really honestly pretty new, um, but I've seen that impact my parents, you know, who can barely find their way around a computer, but they're on Facebook. And, and I, I've seen, I think we can see that impact all areas of our society. And we still need to kind of get a handle on that and, uh, and uh, a grasp of that and how it works. And, and do you feel that that has contributed or, or impacted, I guess, the epidemic that we are seeing around mental health challenges, not just in our schools, but in our communities as well, too. Are you seeing this either professionally or personally? Yeah, I think it does absolutely have an impact on that. And I think with the screen time, you know, we actually, we started our son during the pandemic. We started him uh, virtually um, and said, you know, for his safety reasons, we want him to be accessing school uh, virtually. And then really quickly just realized, you know, this is not working out for him. He's a super social kid. He really wants to see other kids. Um, you know, I remember when we, when he was first born, we kept him home for a year saying, oh, we want to keep him close to mommy and daddy before we take him off to have anyone watch him. So we're killing ourselves. We take him to daycare the first day. Like he didn't even look back. He was just like out of here by <laughs> other people to interact with, you know? So that's that kid and he needs to be around other kids. And so, uh, we adjusted and put him back, back into school. Um, so I think that's one aspect of it is knowing people and you can't just take something in the classroom and stick it up online and assume it's going to be working the same way. They're two very different environments. They can both be profoundly affected, but they can also be profoundly bad. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, whether you're in person or whether you're online, uh, a lot of care needs to be given to that. And, you know, the teachers who are dealing with him online who had to make this sudden switch and, and move, they put a ton of effort into it. I mean, they were killing themselves trying to do this with limited resources and, and learning things on the fly. Um, but they're different sorts of environments, and you have to be aware of how those sorts of things are going to work. So, um, you know, we adjusted and others adjust, and I continue to see this be a challenge with, um, um, you know, I, I ended up getting off of Facebook. Um, my wife got off of Facebook uh, as well. My my parents are still on there, but I've had talks with them about, you know, how is this actually impacting your day? And, um, you know, when we get together for family events, uh, you know, we should not be following the rule that if it's not on Facebook, it didn't happen. You know, if you're taking the picture, take the picture to look at the picture, not to post it for likes. So, you know, these are the sorts of things that we're talking about across, across uh, you know, generations of, of how to deal with these sorts of um kind of new challenges that the society is facing that we're all still kind of trying to figure out. But I think that definitely had, can play a toll on mental health. Um, and apart from that, I think just the, the kind of school environment where um, kids are coming in excited to learn and then being asked to be passive in their own learning um, can also be destructive. And the push for the continued push for comparing students to each other rather than making sure that they're learning and getting what they need from it can also be destructive in that uh, I've seen, you know, nieces and nephews who've really struggled with test anxiety around the standardized testing of, of what, what's going to come out of that and, and the fact that we continue to kind of have the tail wagging the dog of these standardized tests driving the learning rather than assessing the learning, which is what they should be doing, um, is problematic and that, that causes challenges as well. I, I oversee the virtual program for my school district and I know exactly what you're talking about. I've even seen students who are highly successful students. I mean, we're talking AP level, everything, who switch into a virtual environment where it's a little more asynchronous and synchronous and just absolutely fall apart. Mm -hmm. Like they, they're, they're used to this. They're good with the bells. They're good with the structure. They're good with the teacher telling them what to do, but you put them into an asynchronous environment and some of them completely fall apart. Whereas you also said too, there are students who just feel so much pressure and so much stress sitting in the classroom and being told to sit still and being told to sit there and listen and, and do things in a certain order that absolutely flourish in the virtual environment. Mm -hmm. the, the groups that I've seen the, with the most success are students who are dealing through high anxiety issues of their own of personal mental health, um, being able to, again, have that pressure taken off, but also students who 
uh, suffer on the uh, are on the autism autism spectrum, who again no longer feel the the weight of everything. They have more control over their environment. Mm -hmm. um, they have control over time. They have control. It's it's these dances that we're doing right now. And I hope as we come out of the pandemic, that I kept hearing people saying, "Well, we have to get back to normal." Okay, look. I hope that we, we have learned from this. Not everything was great and beautiful and perfect, but let's take what worked for some students and let's really make sure that, as you're saying, it doesn't have to all be the same standardized test. It doesn't have to be the same way that they all learn. Let's really take a universal design to learning approach and saying, what has worked for this child and what can we do to maybe sustain that kind of learning for students? Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly uh, about that we, we really need to, if I'm hearing you correctly, we need to really reassess what learning is, as you said, looking at the child and if they're being successful, not the test score that is comparing them necessarily to somebody else somewhere around the world or in the United States. Exactly. So. That we're meeting them on their level and what's driving things is their learning rather than a, a calendar or a clock that's saying this much time has been spent here. So you should be knowing X, Y, or Z. And if you don't, uh, that's a negative and that's problematic, you know. Um, that was fine when we were focused on sorting people into those who were going to work on the assembly line and those who are going to be telling them what to do, but that's not the reality that we live in any now, in, in anymore. Um, and so we shouldn't be driving, having our education driven by those sort of approaches. So Dr. Watson, as we get to the end of our conversation today, is there uh, any final thoughts that you would like to leave or organizations or people that you feel like we need to be aware of who are also doing great work in the field or maybe working with you at the university? Right. Well, I mean, the main thing I'm always doing is evangelizing for this sort of personalized approach to learning, which would be significantly different. And most people get it and they understand it, but they don't know how to make it happen or, or what's going to be possible. So uh, the one organization that I like to push people to are called um, Knowledge Works, and their website is knowledgeworks.org. So they work on... Um, putting out what these sort of personalized school environments would look like where we don't, um, you know, I have a, a Purdue TEDx talk that, that talks about this need and where we need to get and how those sorts of schools are not going to have grade levels. They're not going to have a typical classroom, but the learning is still going to be collaborative. It's going to be personalized. It's going to be focused on mastery. Um, so they actually look at schools that are trying to do this and trying to piece things together out of uh, what they're able to do. You know, this goes back to, um, when I was in grad school, we, we were able to study some schools like this where they started as an alternative school that was originally supposed to be project-based, but it, they ended up being wherever the, the high school would dump whatever students they couldn't deal with at. And so these students were many coming from families who had never graduated from high school, many facing all sorts of issues, whether they had kids or they were recovering from drug addiction and things like this, being dumped into the school. And it was one principal and one teacher with over 100 kids and they implemented a personalized approach where each kid was given a path forward and said, look, you're in control. You decide how you want to learn, how you want to be assessed, and we'll help manage that. And, uh, you know, they quickly went from being the enemy to, oh, you're actually helping me, and it's me, and it's I'm in control, and this is something I can do, and you're supporting me. Um, and they were able to flourish when they'd never been able to do that before. So, so Knowledge Works looks at schools that are trying to implement these sorts of approaches um, and trying to create these sorts of system of education that we really need to be commonplace instead of just kind of uh, little examples here and there spread across the world. You're, you're speaking my language, all buckets. Here's your standards. I don't care if you're a first grader who's doing algebra or a senior who's doing basic addition. Any teacher can assess you. Uh, and I think of things in our virtual program, we think of it as the one room schoolhouse. Mm. So we have kids who are playing together across age groups and, and connecting across age groups. I, you're speaking, I'm sorry, you're just speaking my language and you're getting us onto a whole other topic of discussion. I can't wait to connect with you, uh, when we get down to Purdue University, April 8th and 9th, uh, will be the symposium on campus in West Lafayette. It will be streamed as well too. Dr. Bill Watson, thank you for being so giving of your time and thank you for being a guest in the Academy of Esports podcast today. Thanks so much. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. 
You may follow me on Twitter at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N. And through the Academy of Esports account at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash TAO Esports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.